Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. On the show today, a look back at all the action from San Marino. So there is just a little bit to talk about. Uh, Ducatis came to play this weekend while up and down the classes. Riders seem to just be dropping like flies on track as one rider bid farewell to an illustrious Grand Prix career. More rider moves were also confirmed coming into the weekend too as MotoGP has a week off before we head into a packed five weeks filled with four races. It's going to get busy. The recording date is Monday, the 5th of September. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash's MotoGP editor, Pete McLaren, and former Grand Prix rider and British champion, Keith Hewin. And Keith, well, let's start uh, with MotoGP, the top of the class, the premier class, future teammates doing battle on the track. But it was Bagnaia who made history, but Bastianini, well, he did not make that easy for him. Yeah, history, of course, being the only four-time uh, Ducati winner on the trot. So, um, well done, Pecco. I mean, you wouldn't have got a lot of odds on that, would you, really? Because he was um, he was fairly short odds when it comes to the fact that he is going to perform in Italy in the way that he did. But you mentioned the track. You alluded to the track. Very difficult conditions in Mizano. We get it often there. It, it, once that temperature rises to a certain level, and race day, it had risen to a certain level, the track just seems to get greasy. We've seen it so many years in a row. And, of course, it caught a lot of riders out. Jack Miller, I felt desperately sorry for Jack Miller. I mean, he must be beating himself up this morning, assuming that he's recovered from Dovi's party last night, which didn't start until 10.30 local time last night. So that would have been a fair old rave, I'm sure. And actually having witnessed Jack being, um, should we say, extricated from a Red Bull um, party one night, um, completely horizontal with a guy under his legs and a guy under his under his neck, taking him out like a roll of carpet, Jack can party. So um, I'm sure that would have been a brilliant, brilliant end of season party. Everyone was invited with a permanent pass. <laughs> Sadly, we're in the UK. Um, I wasn't in Mizano, so I couldn't join in on that one, and neither could you two. But it's a, a permanent pass. Anybody with a permanent pass, that's media, that was everybody that has got a permanent pass to be in the paddock, was invited. Now, that's a lot of people. So it was held in Mizano. I can't imagine... Um, a venue big enough to be honest it must have been spilling out into the street certainly would have been later um back to the racing though um Bagnaia and Bastianini at it which is what we all wanted to see um there's going to be a rub there isn't there between those two and it's very healthy it's going to be it was the right choice Bastianini into the team I feel um they made the right call and uh, Ducati must be thinking to themselves, this is going to be a good year for them in 2023. Might still be a good year for them in 23, in 22. There's six more races still to go. And what is it? 30 points now between Quattararo and Bangaya. 33 covers the top three men now. Um, so those are really the only three that are in it. Alicia Spargo just dropping a place um, because of Peko in the ascendancy. But good weekend in Mazzano. Not a big crowd. I know it can't hold a lot of people, but I, I didn't think it was a, a massive crowd there over the entire weekend, which, again, was slightly disappointing. Well, that's the thing, isn't it, uh, Pete? Keith picked up on, on the championship uh, battle. Um, Fabio Quattararo has been clearly the, the man out front, and it was only a few races ago that we were sort of ruling Peko Bagnaia out for this year. But now that gap, only 30 races. It seems as well that the switch in former Aprilia has has changed. It's got it's now going a little bit more with Maverick Vinales, which is great to see, although LA is still very much up there. But this championship fight is on, and, and in a year where MotoGP admittedly hasn't been as entertaining as perhaps we would have liked as it has been in more recent years. Misano provided, uh, San Marino provided some some good some good racing. It did, it did. In a way, it was the race that we thought we'd see in Austria as far as Quattararo was concerned, wasn't it? That was the, that was where we thought he'd struggle, but he did well in Austria. So we thought, well, he's going to be up there this weekend. But instead, as you say, you know, I mean, buried behind the Ducatis and an Aprilia. Uh, Maverick, uh, who, who picked him? Uh, Maverick doing really well uh, uh, and, and you know, outperforming Aleish. Aleish, you know, he wasn't too devastated afterwards. He said, look, last year, if I finished sixth, we'd hold a party. I mean, this is how far things have moved on for Aprilia, isn't it? But And, and he was saying, look, for me, Cota, Austria, Mizano, they were the three tracks that he really, you know, he wasn't really looking forward to. Aragon is. So the next round is going to be a big one for Aleish because, uh, you know, he needs to get back in, at least in front of Quattararo. But as you say, the, the big thing now is, is Bagnaia's momentum. Four race wins in a row. Is it 60-odd points he's taken out of Quattararo in the last four races? I mean, 
yeah, the, the title is well and truly on as we go into these unknown factor of the flyaway races that, uh, you know, guys haven't been at tracks that guys haven't been at for a couple of years now. It's, uh, yeah, it's really wide open. And you've got the spoiler situation. I think we've sort of glossed over the Maverick Vinales a little bit in that conversation, purely and simply because, you know, Maverick, you would have said years ago, Maverick was a cut above Alicia Spargro as potential race winner. If he's coming back to the kind of form that we thought he was capable of or is capable of, um, he could be a massive spoiler. He can get between Quattararo and the Ducatis on this kind of form at the moment and add an extra dimension to the whole thing. If Alation and Maverick are both performing as as you know they could do, Maverick might take over from Alation as number one in the Aprilia team. That's going to cause a bit of aggravation, which we like, of course, from the spectator's point of view. Um, but also, it's it's a nightmare for Yamaha that suddenly, as the last six rounds come in on the horizon, we've got a situation where there's going to be a few other spoilers stealing points off of Quattararo. That could be very dangerous. Well, it, it highlights, doesn't it, what we've said again all season, you know, Ducati coming into this with a record number of, of uh, bikes on the grid and, and haven't quite been able to piece it together. And But recent form now, especially at the weekend, Fabio Quattararo in that Yamaha is, is swimming in a, in a sea of red. He hasn't got any help. He, you know, Morbidelli yeah, had his best ever qualifying in a long, old while, but it wasn't there with him in the race. Uh, and now you've got the two Aprilias. Uh, this is this is getting uh, tricky for Yamaha to, to figure this out. Yeah, Cal Crutcher has got a lot of work to do when he arrives, hasn't he? <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> would you Would you want to be him? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, there's no expectation. I would expect he's got to do a solid. You know, Stefan Bradl. Does anybody moan about Bradl's? You know, he scored points of the weekend. Has, has anybody moaned about him in recent times? No, not at all. He's a bloody television commentator now. He's you know he's he's virtually retired and he's there as a test rider and he's filling in for for Mark Marquez while he's not there. Well, I can't wait till tomorrow and we start getting the test things. Of course, we jump. I'm jumping again, aren't I? I always ramble. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the to the Mark Marquez situation this week when he gets on a proper motorbike and uses it in anger. We'll see how much of this operation has worked and how race rusty he is um, in the next couple of days. But Cal Crutchlow back on the Yamaha, straight in there. Um, oh, deep end or what? There's a big difference between testing and, and doing things at your own pace when you feel like it than uh, pushing it right to the very edge of things as he will be um, for the next six rounds. You should just say, should we, fastest laps of the race on the last lap. I mean, Keith, I'm sure you could explain that. I mean, right. Jack Miller had some choice words for that, didn't he? But, I mean, it, was, it just showed the level those two It's were difficult to explain fastest laps of the race at the end. As a race engineer, you, you, you think, hang on a second. When, when you get to the end of a race, everything is supposed to be spent. Tyres, rider, bike. It's all supposed to be, you know, finished with. Throw it away or, or start fixing it again. The point being is that when you're doing fastest laps on the last lap of the race, you know, engineers scratch their head and think well why weren't you doing that a little bit earlier on you know it's a it's were you saving tires you know it might have been tire management or something along those lines although they weren't expecting to be tire management going on at Misano um it's not a particularly grippy track it's got a few ripples here and there as well which added to the the, the slippery bit um really does make it a massive task I mean qualifying I have n I, I stood behind the sofa for qualifying just peering over the top at it because that track with a little bit of damp on it Honestly, and they were chase, chasing the track, chasing the evolution of the track. There was, in 15 minutes, there was no room for error at all. And everything could have been a disaster for any one of them at any point. I mean, qualifying two probably was the standout for me of the entire weekend, I've got to say. That really showed the quality of the people in MotoGP. To put it together like that and to put those laps in late on, when as the track was beginning to evolve into a slightly grippier nobody knows until it gets out from under you you just don't know whether you've overstepped the mark until the point when the bike's you know 50 yards up the track and you're <laughs> picking yourself out from under the rector cell it was a, it was a great weekend of action wasn't it pete it, it was, yeah. And also, I mean, there was a, a Jap Ducati GP22 that won. And of course, the, the GP21 was only, what, 0 0.03 behind. So, you know, OK, it's got the latest aerodynamics. But still, we don't really know quite what the difference is between these two riders, other than they're both very fast at the moment, until next year. And that's what Keith says, it's going to be great when they're alongside each other on the same bike. And then we'll really get to see, will Bastianini take a step up on, the next, on, on next year's bike? 
or might he find he doesn't like it as much? We don't know. But certainly, yeah, a year of development and there's almost nothing in it. Bastianini had one bobble. If he hadn't had that one bobble, he would have won at Mazzano. He almost got him on the line. He got better drive out of Mizano. That's turn 16 to the line. I thought he'd got him at one point. You know how your eyes get crossed up by the... That, that finish line is further up the road than you think it is. Uh, where, the, where the flag is, it's a, long, it's a lot further down the road than you think it's going to be. And uh, he'd got drive all the way down the side of um, Bangnaya. And it, like you say, it was uh, thousandths of a second. That was all that was in it at the, at the very end. 27 laps around there is a long way. Hard work. It was a photo finish, wasn't it? <clears throat> right to the line. But um, a lot of talk of the well the weekend about team orders uh, at Ducati. Um, a load of rubbish, Keith. Keep it as it is. They got to fight hard. Team orders is always a contentious issue, particularly in motorbikes. You know, you get a lot of it in cars. You know, there was <laughs> Formula One this weekend. You had exactly the same situation. They switched strategies between Lewis Hamilton and and Russell, George Russell, and Russell was on the right tyres at the end, and Lewis Hamilton wasn't. You know. There are more strategic opportunities in Formula One and those types of formula than there are in MotoGP, unless, of course, it's a a flag to flag where we we have a change of bike. Um, There's strategically possibilities there. But I think that as soon as you start telling one rider to slow down and let another one by or to start, you know, this this situation it, it goes down very badly plus the fact we haven't got you know ship to shore there's no radio contact and there should never be by the way i'm not an advocate of, of, of radio contact between pit wall and, and and racer um it's down to the racer to work out what he's going to do strategically pretty much in the main um so i think that team orders it's contentious they will come i believe later on in the year because they have to you know, if Bagnaya is in a position, go back to the Freddie Spencer, yeah, and I do, go back to the Freddie Spencer, Kenny Roberts year when Spencer pipped Roberts at the end of the year. They, at one point, I think it was Rijeka, the Yugoslavian Grand Prix. That's how long ago countries have even changed since since then. The universe is a completely different place. Um, I seem to remember that Lawson won from Roberts, if I'm correct. I'm, I'm sure I'll be corrected to, uh, later on by everybody that's listening. Um, but it was an opportunity that Yamaha should have switched it around because then Roberts would have enough, had enough points later in the year to have been able to beat um, Spencer. Um, unfortunately, Lawson was a bit more inconsistent that year. He could have helped Roberts later on in the year by beating Spencer, but he didn't have the, the pace to be able to do it. So Roberts was left out on his own in the end and Spencer, Spencer won the championship. Um, now, team orders would have made that change, but they didn't use team orders back then i think the sport has evolved somewhat since then and they will use team orders later on in this year whether we like it or not if jack miller and jack miller moving on as well that's the other type of issue you give the team order to jack miller if he's in a position where he can win a race but yet he needs to help his teammate who is magnaia at the moment and won't be next year what will his decision be now jack's a really really good old boy i think he probably would help magnaia even though it might cost him a race win, hypothetically, later in the year. be interesting to see if that, that transpires, um, because I think Jack will be in two minds. Sure, he'll want to win a race if he possibly can, but I still believe that the gentleman that Jack is, and the fact that he has a great relationship with Bagnaya, um, he may defer to Bagnaya in the, the circumstances where the championship counts for Ducati and for Bagnaya. We'll see. It's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, we heard on the eve of the weekend, there's not team orders as such yet, but there's certainly a bit of guidance that Gigi's given them. Uh, You know, Zarka was explaining that they're told, you're free to race for the win, but if you're sort of fourth, fifth or sixth, and Peko's there, you know, just, (laughs) you know, there's no need to sort of make a big move then. And and, I mean, the big thing is, don't take anyone out, isn't it? That's the main one. But we saw, you know, Bastianini certainly looked like he was trying to win that race. Uh, It got very close on the last lap. You know, Bastini was was sort of making clear that, well, you know, the thing was where I was lined up there, if I needed to run on, I could have gone outside of Pekka and not, you know, he wouldn't have gone up, you know, the inside and potentially taken them both out, which would have been a complete disaster. But it certainly looked like he was trying to win. So I think we have to believe at this stage that, yeah, they are free to race for wins. But as, as Keith says, later in the year, you've got to believe that's going to change. They've been chasing this world championship for so long. It's the one thing missing from Gigi's CV as well. Gigi's won everything else. So this is this is massive for them to try and get this. Can you imagine how everyone at Ducati felt when they saw Andrea Iannone on the wall? 
Yanone was there at the track this weekend and he was <laughs> when he took Dovi out when they should have been one and two or whatever it was at uh, in Argentina <laughs> going back a few years. I think there's been a few nightmares that, are, that have lined up at Ducati that they can do without this year. But I think they've got a very, very solid factory team in in Bang Naya and uh, Jack Miller. I don't think those two will be uh, taking chunks out of each other later on in the year. I think they'll work that out fairly well. But Bastianini, like you've just said, I mean, we saw it with Chantra and um, Bagura, didn't we, the other week uh, in Moto2. It was uh, one of those situations where... You know, Chantra really should have been backing him up, but in the end, he was trying to nick the place off him on the last lap. <laughs> it turned out all amicable in the end, but I think I'd have been less than happy about that if I'd have been uh, your championship leader <laughs> at the time. We love the drama. Um, uh, no team orders uh, yet in our own championship, even though it's very tight. Uh, Pete managed to pick up two points uh, with his predictions of Bagnaia and Bastianini, although Quattararo for the win didn't come to fruition. And unfortunately for, for myself and Keith, only the one point. So now Pete's got 13 points. Keith with 12 and me with 11 it's getting very tight very tight indeed we might need our boss will to implement some team orders later on in the year uh, we'll see which one he chooses or, or, um, or, or we could put money on it because then it becomes re- very serious and we might actually start then it becomes, about things. then the sporting <laughs> bets go out the window <laughs> maybe not let's let's leave a couple more leave a couple more we might be able to scrape back um uh, you mentioned uh, um uh, most two motor three let's have a look at uh, what was going on in the uh, lower classes as well most so two, first of all, uh, Pete, Alonso Lopez, well, he controlled the race, really, uh, from the front to, to win Moto2 in, in San Marino, ahead of Aaron Canet and uh, Augusto Fernandez in the end, gutting, though, for Jake Dixon after, well, it was all undone in qualifying, really, and then crashed out early doors. And, well, the big talk of the town, Paul said to Celestino Vietti, crashing out as well, and that drops him down to fourth in the championship now. Yeah, he's in real trouble now, isn't he, in terms of the championship? I think he'd said, I, I, you know, I can't make any more mistakes. And then, and then what happened? Exactly what, what he didn't want. So, as you say, massive win for Lopez. I mean, this guy wasn't even on the grid at the start of the year. He came in in place of Fenate when, when he got sacked. And that was quite a controversial thing. First win for somebody not on a Calix since uh, 2019. And the last guy to win on the speed up, a certain Fabio Quattararo, who went down to congratulate them in Park Ferme. So, yeah, a fan, yeah, massive moment for, for the team, for Lopez, uh, everybody. I mean, he's really sort of marking himself out there. But yeah, in terms of the championship battle, um, yeah, it's still close, isn't it? For Fernandez and Agura up there at the top. Fernandez, these rumours about MotoGP now, you know, is he going to be the guy that comes in? Where's the room? It like, well, <laughs> it looks like he'll be, yeah, in place of Remy. I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, we're not hearing anyone else linked to that seat alongside Paul at Tectoire. I mean, that's... It's a big call, isn't it? I mean, to 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 make that switch, but uh, that's the way it's looking. So, but at the moment, he's got a title to win, and and that's again, is that sort of playing on his mind a bit? He had a big accident on the Saturday, you know, that that wouldn't have helped. He sort of he's been pretty sore, I would have thought, from the way he barrel rolled uh, through the gravel. So yeah, and Agura again, you know, he's kept the title fight alive. Wasn't the the kind of Austria domination by the by the by the Honda Team Asia guys? Chantra, as, as Keith was saying, he, unfortunately he wasn't up there this weekend, so he wasn't able to make an impact. Just still a bit up and down with his results. But uh, and, and Jake Dixon, yeah, as you say, you know, I mean, he he'd fallen in qualifying, starting a long way down, needed a big first lap, and he got a big high side at the first UK. It did make me wonder, you know, really good friends with Quattararo. Quattararo would have seen that. Quattararo needed a big first lap as well. Instead, he didn't. You know, Quattararo was was basically, he didn't make up any ground on that opening lap. And you do just wonder if that maybe, you know, did he think, right, no, I need to be a bit bit more careful than perhaps he was planning to be through that opening chicane, having just seen what happened to Jake when Jake was trying to make up positions. for him. I think it was 18th on the grid, wasn't it? So it did just show that if you're offline there and trying to make up a lot of ground, it can all go wrong. Bosco Scuro, of course, um, formerly speed up, uh, different chassis with that kind of track conditions might just have been the difference that worked for the race winner. It's one of those situations where, you know, sometimes you get that anomaly, don't you, with the speed up. It seems to work really well on some tracks somewhere, sometime. Uh, maybe that was a, a, just a, a point to, to bring into that part of the conversation. Glad you brought Remy up. Because well, I'm I'm now going to get on my soapbox and have a little bit of a controversial rant. What the unprofessional? What the freaking hell is going on in KTM? What annoys me more than anything is that <clears throat> clearly Remy's manager, and if you read the rants that Wayne Garden, the dad of of Remy, is going through at the moment, 
Um, you might as well discount them because Wayne is just off on one at the moment. He just wants to fight with anybody. And I don't blame him um, being a dad. Um, but the point being, if you've got a manager that's upsetting the management at KTM, which is what it seems to, the crux of this whole row seems to be about, who needs to be the bigger person in this, the bigger company in this? Where are KTM and their management calming this down so they're getting the best out of their world championship winning current Moto2 world champion who has been with them, what, seven months? And they are allowing this to get under their skin to the point where we are talking about, you know, accusing their rider of uh, and his management team of being unprofessional. Somebody needs to be the bigger person in the KTM corner here and take control of this as good management and good manufacturers do. You would never see a, a Japanese factory washing their bloody dirty laundry for all to see. It just would not happen. I, I, I think KTM have a percentage to blame in all of this as well, to be able to, you know, <clears throat> riders say things in the heat of the moment. That's perfectly normal. You know, I did a podcast with Michael Laverty, uh, you know, earlier on this, this last week. And the point being, Michael, you know, his two riders are a bit grumpy at Silverstone and they made it known to the press. And Michael basically said, you know, like, we want riders to be, forthright we understand because he's a rider you know sometimes emotions get ahead of things and that you say things you shouldn't say but it's up to me to manage that gap between what they're saying and our sponsors and our corporate representatives the ones that we represent so it's a situation where michael laverty has a handle on these things and he's a brand spanking new team owner the might of ktm with the kind of talent they've got in a managerial situation in my view, and it's only my view, and I'll be interested to hear what everybody at home thinks about this, I feel that KTM have a, a certain percentage of blame for not managing the situation as well as they should as a corporation, as a team management situation. I don't understand how they've let it get to the point where we've got mudslinging in public. Ridiculous. We heard a bit more, didn't we, about sort of the... the the two sides of this, as I say, this, this not professional enough came as quite a, quite a shock when we, when Remy said that that was what he'd been told was the reason. Um, Remy was asked, well, did they give you any examples of that? You know, and he said that, no, there was nothing else given. Then Pip Barra spoke to Simon Crafar. Simon Crafar did a good interview with him. I think it was the Saturday morning or something at uh, Mizano and, and kind of, you know, pressed him on a few parts of all this and what's going on. And, and Pip Barra was sure that he said, look, you know, we didn't say this. So they, at the moment there's this, who said what, we don't know. But the interesting thing going on from that was that Pip Barra said that there was an option on Remy's contract that wasn't taken up in June. So so his point was that, that they shouldn't really, Remy and his manager have been shocked by this as such in that when that wasn't taken up in June, that I guess perhaps they should have looked elsewhere. But then clearly Remy was told in Austria that there wasn't anywhere for him next year. And it did come as a shock. So, OK, the option wasn't taken up. But still, Remy and, and presumably his manager believed that, that this was going to continue, this relationship. And uh, and then suddenly it's not. And there's nothing left. It's too late. And that's what that's what Remy's really there's, upset about, isn't it? It's, it's, it's too late now. There's no, there's well, no I'm, I'm, I, somehow I, I just that doesn't scan well with me either, purely and simply because there's no way you would have to be a complete dick of a manager to not put yourself in a position where the option remains open before you get to the point where KTM press the button. We all know KTM jump really quick. Look what happened with, you know, Joe Anzarco was not having a good relationship with the bike. I think he was getting on all right with everyone else, but he wasn't having a great time when he was at KTM. So he gave them notice that, look, I'm going to be looking elsewhere by the end of the year. And what did KTM respond with? They fired him out of there straight away. They're ruthless. And that's how it should be. You know, it, it, this is a massively cutting edge business for all parties. I can't believe that, that Remy Gardner's manager, Paco Sanchez, isn't it, would be so stupid. Who, who, who is also Juan, Juan Mir's manager, we should say. So this is not an inexperienced manager. This is someone who is, who is doing deals with MotoGP world champions and factory teams. And I, 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 I can't believe, Pete, that he would have put Remy in a position where he had no options, which he seems to have no options at this moment in time. Yeah, you might be pushing KTM because you've got another option hidden in the background somewhere. You've got one tucked away, you know, 
everybody sees these management guys all wandering around behind the trucks, all tra- secret talks and all that. It's great spotting. That's where I put my deck chair up on the Urta deck and, and watch all these guys spreading out around and having their secret talks, trying to put the chess pieces on the board where they want them. And like you say, this guy is not, well, <laughs> unless you speak to Wayne Gardner, he's not an idiot. Somewhere along the lines, I can't believe that he put Remy in a position where he allowed an option to disappear off the table, KTM to withdraw it, and they didn't have a backup. That's just not, no manager does that. No manager, you know, he won't get another, you know, no other rider will sign with him in that paddock if this turns out to be the truth of the matter. Um, so I, 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 there's more to this story behind the scenes. I, I think KTM have taken a, a, a very, very ruthless line with Remy Gardner. He's only been with them, what, seven months? Yeah, you know, we've, you know, a MotoGP rider that's come through as a, a Moto2 world champion into MotoGP and he's given that amount of time. It doesn't really matter what he says or how he feels. You know, riders are, you know, they speak their mind and he needs his knuckles wrapping if that's been the case. But it's down to the management of the team to fix that situation. If they don't agree with his manager over the way that he's negotiating with KTM, then that's around the table thing. You know, these guys are professionals. I don't understand how it can get to the stage that he's got to without people talking and remedying whatever the problem is. Um, it, it just seems ludicrous to me. I, I feel, uh, you know, and this is a real punt because I have no inside line on this at all, that KTM have taken an opportunity to unload Remy. Um, you know, blame the manager, easy to do. Um, and Remy's been left iron dry. You know, He'll find somewhere in Moto2, I feel. I mean, he was a Moto2 world champion. Now, was he a Moto2 world champion along the lines of, you know, one or two of the others? No, he wasn't. He found it hard work to get to be world champion. Now, that might go against him. You know, how many points did he win the title by? It was a, you know, skinny your teeth thing in the end. Is that going to go against him in Moto2? You know, things have moved on, and they do move on really rapidly. Remy can find himself in great trouble here. Shame. He's a good kid. Is our super bikes not an option for him? Well, they might be, but it's not an option if you're a Grand Prix rider. You know, if you're a Grand Prix rider, Premier Class is where you're supposed to be. You know, he's been in the Premier Class. He's been a world champion of MotoGP. You know, it's you don't want to be slipping to the Tito Rabats coming and having a play at BSB. I mean, that just isn't the way to go, is it? You know, it's 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 just not. I mean, BSB is fantastic, but mate, you're you're having to put it on the line. You're, everything is on the line at BSB. Anybody who thinks that BSB is an easy option, it ain't. Anybody who thinks that the World Superbike is an easy option, it really isn't. You know, and, and once you've slipped out of, of Grand Prix, there is a certain, you know, almost a hidden ego situation here as well. You know, you, you, you arrive at, you have got to put your mind set when you go to World Superbikes, for instance, you've got to put your mindset, I am up against the best guys in the world here forget about the machinery these guys are bloody good jonathan ray you know in my view could have won at motor gp you know bautista was not a shabby motor gp rider you know you, you're looking at bloody fast guys here um so it's, it's one of them situations that, that that i think is going to be difficult for remy i think remy likes riding motorbikes enough that he will go to a championship wherever that might be. He ain't going to be. He ain't going to be stopping riding. So he'll take whatever the best option is on the table. But at the minute, he ain't Moto GP, and it might not be Moto Two. We'll see. Do you, Do you think? I think this oh, sorry, is. Sorry, Pete. No, go on. I was just going to say that the one thing that surprises me about all this, when you sort of putting all that aside of what's gone on here, is that because we've seen Ika Lacona, you know, your your guy Harry, who lost his right. You know, Danilo Petrucci both moved out, but in a way. That was different because there was this pressure coming from Moto2, the Moto2 guys. You know, there was two guys who were top of their game, one and two in the championship, pushing up. And so you could kind of, it was a hard decision for those, you know, KTM to replace those, uh, Lacona and Pacucci. But you could see kind of why on that basis. Whereas there isn't really that that person pushing to come up. You know, Acosta looks like he's still a year or two away from MotoGP. You know, Fernandez, he's fighting for the title, but it's by no means, you know, he's not dominating or he's, you know, at the moment, okay, there's six rounds left. There isn't that that sort of, well, we've got to find a place for this guy in Moto2, so I'm sorry. You know, th- that situation doesn't seem to exist at the moment. And I think that's also, you know, where's the urgency to sort of 
push Remy aside at the moment? You know, is there really someone better lined up? Quite, it's quite interesting, isn't it, at the moment? I mean, we've we've seen how riders are moved around on the chessboard like they do by their management. But at the minute, it seems like management is getting a bit of kicking. I mean, Emilio Alsamora has just been booted out by Mark Marquez and Alex Marquez. Um, Emilio Alsamora has managed Mark since day one really and and there's been a he was a good ex rider himself um and had done a pretty good job but they've moved him on as well this game is is pretty cutthroat i think that um you know you're not if you're not getting what you need out of the out of the situation moving on crew chiefs we've seen the way that crew chiefs move around you know it's a, it's a, you know jerry burgess when he was unceremoniously dumped by valentino rossi having been there from the pretty much the early days Cal Crutch, though, he's not going to have the same crew chief that Dovi had. You know, Roman Fakada is, 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 well, at the minute, hanging up his spanners, it would seem. But um, I can't believe that. But maybe Roman has had enough as well as Dovi. Um, so you've got a situation where I think it's Gubellini who's coming across to, to look after Cal. Um, is it? I don't know. Let me think about that for a second. Maybe not. Uh, so it's the, 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 at the moment, it'll be the, the test team crew chief. Gabbacera, oh, Gabbacera, sorry, Gabbacera. Sorry, beginning with G. Yeah, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Italian begins with G. Yeah, yeah Silvano Gabbacera, you're right, who is actually a good pair of hands. But all the same, it's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to see these movements going on in the background that not a lot of people are aware of or, or, or take any notice of, but they make massive differences. You know, quite how the Marquez thing is going to work out. You know, seeing Marquez overseeing virtually what Honda doing at the moment. And he's going to be overseeing it even more. He's going to be on the bike this week. So he's really trying to push it in a direction that he wants the engineering to go in. And in the meantime, he's taken on new management to, to organize the other side of life uh, in a similar manner. It's, it's, it's very interesting to watch the, the overall dynamic of, of being a top line motorbike racer nowadays. Just to to come back to, to the Remy situation and finish that off, uh, is it does it reflect badly not just on on the team or manager or rider or whatever way you look at it, but on MotoGP as a championship as well? In, in a week where you know we've seen this big fan survey come out and and the the reactions from that and whether you take them with a pinch of salt or not, it, the fact that the current reigning Moto Two World Champion. It is not going to have a place after seven months where he hasn't looked particularly out of place. He's probably done as bad as best as he could have done on that Tech 3 bike alongside Fernandez. Does that not look good for the championship? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's a big problem. I think it's it's a situation that, that happens from time to time. I mean, again, you know how I like to beat you over the head with Formula One, Harry. Um, you know, you've got the, the situation with, you know, the guy that Alpine and, and McLaren... You know, Alpine never even had a contract, and yet they were taking the McLaren to court over their driver that they both thought they'd signed. But it turns out one's only got heads of terms. How on earth does a professional setup like Alpine put themselves in that position? It's not a contract till it's signed. It's ridiculous. You know, I'm buying a house. I've got a heads of terms for buying the house. Someone else bought it from under me. Well, hang on a minute. You've only got a heads of terms. You hadn't got a contract. It's just the, the you know, 101. It's like, <laughs> how does this happen? So I think the management um, cock up, if you like, with Remy uh, is something that we will hear more of yet. We've not actually had a response from Paco Sanchez in any way, shape or form. It will be interesting to see how he, if he responds to this um, allegation of mismanagement um, from KTM. But I contend still that KTM should have been the bigger party in this and got control of the negotiations, got control of the circumstances and made something better of it than they did. I don't think they've come out of this without egg on their faces. I think they must take a percentage responsibility is, is my view. Uh, well, let us know what you think as well. It'd be great to hear uh, your thoughts in, in the comments uh, below. Or if you're watching on YouTube, or let us know. Uh, just search for Crash Moto GP on uh, the whatever social media you choose. Um, let's just round off Moto 2 then. Of course, it is now Augusto Fernandez back into the overall championship lead, 198 points. Aigura drops to second. Arikanet moves up to third. And now Celestina Fietti down to fourth after uh, the pulses had crashed out in Moto2. Uh, Moto3, uh, we talked about this uh, guy last week and how it, the season wasn't going his way, Dennis Foggia, but he's now brought himself P3 
Pete, back into the championship race, really, after winning, came out, uh, you know, sort of uh, on top in a bit of a four-way battle it was uh, for the win. And now that title charge seems to be uh, reignited. He's back in there, isn't he? Yeah, another home win for him at Mizano. So great for him, the team, everybody at uh, Leopard. A, a big victory there, combined with Garcia having that sort of nightmare, the the, the title leader going into the race. Didn't he? he had a uh, falling off and then coming into the pits and then rejoining and then getting black flag. But I mean, he was, you know, by the time he, he came into the pits, it was all over as far as the points anyway. But uh, but yes, so uh, Guevara is uh, is now leading the championship, isn't he? After that, getting the third place didn't maximize on. On Garcia's mistake, because as you say, Foggia and Massia were uh, were up there heading in first and second. But um, yeah, I think Foggia, you know, it's a bit like Banyaya, isn't it? It's 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 there. If he wants to do it, he's got the chance now. He can do it um, because of these mistakes by the other guys. That's really what he needed to get back into this. So uh, you know, can he can he keep it going? It could be we could see a close finish in in a lot of the all three championships. Really, it could go down. Well, you're talking thirty points with Banyaya. Um, to Quattararo, and you're talking 35 points in this situation in Moto3, you know, it's close enough with six rounds to go, 25 points for a win. And uh, if Fogia, and we've seen him do this before, he can get a run. Once he's getting a run on things, Leopard hasn't quite looked the sharpest motorbike that it has done in uh, retrospectively. If you look at Leopard, the performance of their bikes have been absolutely outstanding, a cut above every other Moto3 machine. They seem to be in the pack a bit at the moment. It doesn't seem to be a massive advantage like they seem to have had previously but uh, whether they can turn that around and Foggia keeps the, the momentum going it's going to be really interesting these flyaways there's so much at risk when you are back to backs when you've got back to backs you you know fall out of bed awkwardly in the morning and you, you've got an injury that you're carrying them for the next three races or whatever it might be it's it's something where the tiniest thing can can mess up the momentum or <laughs> you can have fantastic momentum through the entire last six rounds not looking forward to Valencia. I've got to say, Valencia, I've always thought it's a dull one to end with. Freezing bloody cold it will be at the end of November. I mean, honestly, it's just, it's a, it's a cart track anyway. You can't pass. You know, it's it's, it's it's past its sell-by date, Valencia. We ought to be, you know, Barcelona would be better. It's a better track, um, you know, from my perspective anyway. But ending in Valencia with a bit of a cart track in freezing cold concrete, you know, cauldron that is, you know, the room. Tormo circuit, Ricardo Tormo circuit. It's just, um, it's unfortunate. I hope the championship doesn't hinge as it has done so many times on Valencia at the end of it. I think if we get to uh, when we get to the off season, uh, we should have the uh, Keith's ideal calendar um, and revealed. We'll do we'll do a your perfect calendar for the MotoGP championship. We'll put you to work over the winter, and you can come up with that. Um, They'll be Guevara, at Kilberston, by the way, because it's only down the road. <laughs> <laughs> you'll get even less people um <laughs> oh that's a hard hit sorry that's sorry hit. sorry it's too soon it's too soon well um, we should mention that survey that motor gp did that we were talking about yeah, off air well, God, let, right, let's do that. So, Guevara, just do Moto3, Guevara leading uh, now overalls. Not a good weekend for Sergio Garcia uh, after a crash and that black and white flag disqualification. Foggia brings himself into play in third now. And uh, Jamal Messia, again, not not a... Uh, well, he's back in fourth after Suzaki unfortunately, crashed out. So, where uh, he overtakes Suzaki in that championship. But yes, uh, might well go down to the wire. It's going to be a busy one in Moto3 and Moto2. Uh, but, of course, yeah, go on. Let's, let's talk about this, uh, this survey that, that's coming out i've got all the details uh, on my little screen here um it's something like a hundred over a research sample of almost one hundred and ten thousand fan responses analyzed from 179 con- countries um what do we actually learn from it well that's the question isn't it Ari? and i'm glad you said that mm. i mean this is a james allen type um underlined situation remember james allen as, a, as the formula one commentator and broadcaster some time ago He was uh, heading this off. It's well written. It's well presented. But it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's not representative of what we need to find out for MotoGP. You know, these are fans. You know, it's it's fine tuning for fans at the end of the day. People that are already fans of. People that are already going pretty much around the world. You know, Pete made a good uh, suggestion earlier on. Was it done in lots of different languages? Was it done in, you know, maybe 10 different languages? Because some of the demographics that you've reeled off and probably will do again in a minute, you know, don't fit with Indonesia, Thailand, for instance, which is a very young demographic that, you know, 
these guys go on their, their their bikes. You only have to look in the stands to see how young a lot of them are. And yet, I think one of the stats you came up with, 36% of respondents were were 36 years old or something like that, which is more a Western demographic than a than a than a, 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 a an Eastern, Far Eastern uh, demographic. Um, my disappointment with the survey, if there, if I have to say that, and I will, is that we need to look at new fans. Where was the question to, you know, people that don't go to motorbike races, that don't watch motorbike races, that have never considered motorbike races? You know, the question would be, have you ever considered um, attending a MotoGP? Why haven't you considered attending a MotoGP? Why have you considered attending a MotoGP but haven't attended a MotoGP? Do you follow MotoGP? What, you know, media do you follow it on? Because one of the big problems that we've got from a wider audience point of view is it's almost bloody invisible. You know, in the UK, we don't get anything. You know, daily papers, magazines, nothing. You know, it's almost invisible in this country, which is another reason why the likes of Silverstone only have 41,000 people there, because we're not replenishing the reserves of youngsters coming through because it's a cool sport. We all know it is, but we're all a bit longer in the tooth. Sorry, Harry, I'll include include you in that, even though you are a youngster. (laughs) Um, but it is a situation where I feel like the wrong questions are asked to the wrong people. Yeah, we want to know what our fans feel. Of course we do. But there's a, there's a much wider issue to, to find out why the wider demographic are not involved in MotoGP. What are the reasons? What holds them back? What makes them not even consider coming to the track or or watching it on TV? I mean, this this includes TV. I mean, really... Your BT Sports, your Sky Sports, and so on ought to be running these these surveys to work out who are our viewership. You know, who's watching MotoGP? You know, why why are we not appealing to football fans, to tennis fans, to to other sports fans? I watch tennis. I watch. No, I don't watch football. I can't do it. It's just not done. Rugby. You're maybe. a football man. <laughs> but the point being is, is that you know, I'm not exclusive just to MotoGP although that is my number one sport by by a long chalk. But the fact is I watch other sports. Now, do other sports fans watch MotoGP? If they don't, why not? What's what's happening? Why is that the case? We have got a fantastic product. We have got some of the best racing on a Sunday afternoon. You can't take your bloody eyes off it mostly. Okay, we've had a dip this year in 2022, granted. I'm not trying to sell somebody something that isn't happening, but generally... Our three classes are fantastic, or four if you want to include the World Cup of, you know, battery-powered clocks. <laughs> Wait till Ducati take over, then you'll love it. Then you'll love it. Uh, well, I, I, I actually don't not love it now. The racing is actually pretty good. It's just the motorcycles that, that I, yeah. I find slightly difficult. But anyway, that's just me personally. But I mean, so Pete, I mean, Pete, what do you make of this? Some of the other uh, things to come out of uh, this, uh, they did ask, uh, or they collected data to to rank the most popular MotoGP riders. So that uh, Fabio Quattararo in first, Marquez in second, Peko Benyai in third, and that's an interesting one because uh, we we spoke about how MotoGP uh, now losing, while well, Marquez not on the grid at the moment, and and Valentino Rossi, where are the aliens that we need for people to stand out uh, and create their own sort of profile almost above the sport, like Lewis Hamilton has in Formula one uh, to c- follow up on what Keith has said about who they've been talking to 92% of fans uh, identified as avid followers um, so they are going for people who know obviously about MotoGP which I get I get that there obviously has to be a certain amount but that's 92% yeah that's it uh, as you say with the, with the most popular riders, certainly that, that one raised quite a lot of eyebrows. I mean, you know, Fabio is relatively young in his career. Mark has been around for 10 years and is a, a six time world champion. And certainly from, from all our data at Crash, like every website, we know what people read. It would can be Mark. I, can I interrupt Fabio. slightly? What relevance is that? What does that tell us? You know, 92% voted Quattararo as, as the most popular rider. What use is that to anybody? Apart from the ego of, 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 of whoever. The PR teams? <laughs> I don't, I, I just, honestly, I do not get the relevance of something like that. It doesn't make sense to me why we are asking fans, you know, like, <laughs> who's your most popular rider? It's like, it's like my seven-year-old worked out that survey. 
Well, that's it. And you can also, I mean, anybody can go to things like Google Trends and you can type in, as some other journalists, you can type in the riders' names. If you want to know that kind of thing, you don't really need, as Keith says, to bother doing a survey on it. It's quite easy to see, you know, the popularity or the interest in a, in any person, whether a sportsman, whoever it is, by using those kind of things to show worldwide trends in what people search for and everything else. Um, but coming back to it, as you say, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of there was no real clear, OK, this survey survey identified this problem. And we're going to do this to fix it. That was the part that we didn't really hear about. The, the only things that we know are changing is the sprint race. And that was really all that yeah. we heard from as far as what is how popular, change for And next how popular year. was that in the survey? Uh -uh. Yeah, people were happy with the length of the race, I think, weren't they? as it is now. So a normal race. So, they, they, you know, it doesn't really need to be... I didn't see the demand for a short race other than it was brought up that, that whenever there is a restarted race, a shorter restarted race, that, that people always say, oh, get ready, there's going to be a sprint race. But, you know, is that really going to bring in new viewers, which is really what, as Keith says, that's what the sport is looking for is new viewers. And a lot of this, a lot of the analysis didn't really, really seem to. Well, the analysis was that, that the sprint race on Saturday was not popular among current fans, the 92 percent. It got a very small percentage in acceptance on that survey from what I read, which brings me back to the point that sprint race really is designed for non-regular fans at the moment. It will bring more people in. And granted, I think it will. I think the sprint race is a good idea. I think it will work. But for most most fans from that survey's uh, judgment seems to have been not as popular as we might have liked it to have been, or certainly that Dorna would have hoped it would have been, which is why I think the survey missed the target that it was really intended for is where what can we fix in our sport that gets us to a wider audience and you know it, it, it just i mean i i was i read the, the motor gp you know they put it out it's there for everyone to read it's not a private survey or anything like that so if you fancy going on motorgp.com it's there for, for, for everyone to read um but it just didn't seem to be the kind of survey that we needed that the sport needed um you know and some of the respondents, I, 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 you know, again, you've got emerging markets like Indonesia. You said it earlier on, Peter, when we were off air. You know, there's 250 million people in Indonesia. You know, we're talking about a massive, massive motorcycle market. Their opinion counts. You know, if you if you add in Thailand and some of the other, you know, Asia Pacific regions as well that, that are going big market wise with MotoGP, you know, their influence counts or should. You know, we, we should be emerging more in America. I mean, America is something that's, that, that you know, we've got COTA, Circuit of the Americas, but really it's just about hangs on by the skin of its teeth, you know, financially over the years because it's not getting any governmental help as far as I'm aware now. Um, it's a situation where other things count. You know, it's fantastic that we've got 92% of regular avid viewers and watchers and, and respondents to, to our sport because we're all passionately in love with it. But hesitantly, I say they count, but not as much as the bigger issue of bringing in more people from a wider audience, from a wider demographic. And we're not achieving that. And we still don't know why. It's, it's a fascinating uh, um, PDF you can download. A question to you both. If I asked you, what is the pinnacle of motorsports? What would you say? It depends if you're talking about racing or if you're talking about um, popularity. Okay, well, well, it's a question that MotoGP asked in the survey and didn't provide that specific uh, differentiation. And I think it's something like 84% of fans view it as the pinnacle of motorsport. Don't get me wrong, it's absolutely the top tier. But I think that, does that underline perhaps this survey has not quite honed in on what exactly it needs. 66% of people, uh, MotoGP fans, said that MotoGP is not doing enough to attract new fans. Well, that's and right. that's over half. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fairly straightforward. <laughs> fairly straightforward. Well, to, to answer your question then, the pinnacle of, 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 are we talking motorsport overall? I can't remember the question exactly. So the pinnacle of motorsport. Well, yeah. The pinnacle of motorsport is undoubtedly Formula One. Can we just, can we clip that up? Yep, you um. can clip that up. He's <laughs> undoubtedly Formula One. And I have to say, quite rightly, you know, it's a global sport that reaches a, a bigger audience and it has more clout than any other motorsport. MotoGP 
is in its slipstream and could become a massive contender. At one point, Formula One was in trouble because MotoGP audiences were, were becoming bigger than Formula One. But Formula One dragged its socks up, got rid of the old boy and, uh, and, and started to appeal to your social media and, and digital bloody youngsters. And, and that we've been, we've always been quite good on that in that we, we, you've got to, you, anyone can get involved in, in platforms that riders are on and, and teams are on, whereas you couldn't do that in Formula One back in the day. But we haven't really gone the next step. We've not gone the next step to, to, to move that to our young audience, our next audience, if you like. I'm sorry to have to say I think, I think that, that's it. that about Formula One. It's where do you, where do you position it, isn't it? It's, where do you, it's, a, it's a great question, really. Where is MotoGP positioned? And I think when it was at its best, if you like, in terms of the popularity that Keith was talking about sort of previously, it was as this. It was for, as a, an alternative for a younger audience to Formula One, maybe. And this is perhaps what we've lost, and we've got to try and get back. It was the, you know, it was the fun, more exciting alternative to Formula One. You know, the older people would watch Formula One, and the younger people were more into watching the motorbikes. And maybe that's been blurred now. Formula One has now worked that out, and they've gone for that younger audience. And it's not that clear distinction. I mean, look at the Mizano crowd on Sunday. Keith was bringing it up fifty-seven thousand in twenty nineteen. It was ninety-six thousand. You know, it was 100,000 for the weekend. 2019, obviously the, the last year before the pandemic, 160,000. Is that just Valentino Rossi? Who knows? But the point is, this is why this survey is coming out, is because there are tracks. There are. It's being played down. People are saying, oh, it's only one or two races. But we are seeing big drops at, at Silverstone, at Mugello, and, and, and now at Mazzano and other places. The audience is online, everything else. There's a reason behind these surveys. And I think we all know that it is, they need fresh fans coming in and, and as he said where do you find them a lot of it is now you know people find things on youtube if i watch a youtube video sometimes now i see a, an advert for a sports car race now i don't watch sports car oh, races God at all. Forbid. but the point is it makes me aware of that sport and i now know i've heard of that sports car race because it was being advertised on youtube when i'm watching a usually some enduro video or something <laughs> something something random like that but that kind of thing, you know, it's, it's how do you reach, you can see that, that I, you know, I remember looking and thinking that's an effective way of reaching a new audience. That w I mean, I wouldn't go searching for sports cars, but it's a clip of an actual race with the commentary and everything else, you know, as a, as a 30 minute advert, basically. But it's not advertising anything. It's just forcing you to watch some action clips of that race. You know, good way to reach a new audience, that kind of thing. But we, we see in MotoGP that, you know, they need to, we heard in the press conference that they think they need to do more on social media. Keith brought this up as well. That's how a lot of people, young people follow the sport now. We know that MotoGP is, is very much the media room is orientated towards print media, TV, you know, it's so they, they, they will have to go a lot more towards these the digital media that the young people follow. It's the about sport. algorithms. When you go on Amazon, it brings up a whole load of stuff that you think you actually want, but didn't actually go there for because it's bloody smarter than I am. And it brings up stuff that I, I kind of know I want and you always end up ordering it. And it's the same thing. If you've got an algorithm where you're watching certain things on, on a digital platform, it can work out what might be appealing to you and bang it in front of you. You know, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing, but we're not taking advantage of some of that and we need to. It knows what you want before you want it, doesn't it? Um, it's uh, a, a really fascinating uh, uh, survey. Uh, if you get the chance to have a little flick through it, it's, it's really easy to read as well. It's, it's nice, nicely spaced out, so you're not going to be feeling like you're reading a, a million-page document either. Um, let's uh, we're, we're we're running out of time, but uh, there's still a couple of things uh, to discuss. Uh, talk about knowing things uh, coming into the weekend. One man that knows, or two men that know what they're doing now, and one of them who had a big choice to make, uh, Miguel Oliveira and Ralph Fernandez, uh, now officially confirmed at RNF Aprilia for 2023. And Keith, well, it seemed like uh, well, Tech Three KTM were were trying to keep uh, Oliveira, but. I think it's the the pace of Maverick Vinales and the form that he's found that has convinced Oliveira to go, right, Aprilia is my future. And you wouldn't argue with him, would you? Because it certainly looks that way. Aprilia have made massive steps this year and now they've got two factory riders that are right, you know, podium material. You know, the, 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 the factory will be enhanced by having two in an independent team. So I, th I think it's a good move. You know, Tech 3 have fallen behind. I mean, when Yamaha dumped Tech 3, KTM picked them up as an independent. It's never quite looked right, has it? It's never quite. They put two rookies in there. It's never quite worked out. Um, and I think that the, you've got a little bit of pushback at the moment against KTM. 
and against Tech 3. Unjustified, I feel, with, with Tech 3. It's a great little team. But the point being is is that the, the moment, you know, I could see how Oliver would have made that decision and why. What, once he'd lost his factory KTM seat to Jack Miller, wasn't it? it I think he knew it, it's very difficult to get back into a factory team with the same manufacturer once they've moved you to one side. Now, of course, we're, we're seeing the gas cast branding of Tech Tour and everything else, and I think they hoped that that would persuade Oliveira. But the reality is, it's still it's still the satellite team, and yes, they're going to have the same bikes as they say, but then they're supposed to be having the same bikes now. So really, it's only the the sponsorship and the branding that's changing for next year, and I think. Oliveira, as you're saying, he's seen Maverick Vinales get on that bike. And this is almost exactly one year on now, isn't it? Since he, he first got on the Aprilia and he's now had three podiums and probably would have had another one if the bike didn't, the ride height thing didn't jam in, in Germany. So they're seeing that somebody can come from a V4 engine bike, um, or, or sorry, they are on, a Oliveira's on a V4 engine bike. He's going to still be on a V4 engine bike. Maverick's gone from the inline four to um, the V4 on the Aprilia. And he's adapted to it. He's been able to, within a year, he's now up there now quicker than Aspargaro, who has been the standard for the Aprilia for so many years. So, yeah, and and also the Massimo Rivola, you know, this guy, Maverick credits him a lot. Aleix credits him a lot. You've got a guy like Fernandez who hasn't really looked comfortable or, or happy in MotoGP, dare I say it, so far this year, you know, but he's got the talent. And I think they'll be they'll be hoping that uh, certainly in Fernandez's case, Oliveira as well, but Oliveira is a proving four time winner. But that they can extract that talent, you know, they can give him the environment that he needs to really really perform. I mean, he's got this deal basically on on the back of the Moto Two season, hasn't he? I mean, if you were looking at this year in Moto GP, you wouldn't be rushing to sign Ralph Fernandez. But it's what he's done before, and people remember that they tried to get him before both Aprilia and Mazda Rosali tried to get Fernandez. Um, for this year, they've now come together. So it's almost like a dream team situation for them because they were both fighting to try and sign him. They both lost out because KTM moved him up <laughs> to their team. But now they've both got the guy that they've been chasing for a year. So good news all round, I think, for them. For Fernandez, it's a big change. And really, he's got to perform. I mean, the bike, you know, it's a proven bike. It's a consistent bike. As Oliveira said, that's that's a key thing for him. It's a pretty, it's up there pretty much every week. It's a top six bike. So, uh, you know, that's what he's looking for. And, uh, yeah, interesting to see what he can do. But on the other hand, the Aprilia factory team, it's locked out for the next two years. You know, the, the um, Spargo and Vinales are signed there for the next two years. So this is a long-term switch. You know, they'll be looking now at trying to get to the Aprilia factory team in 2025. That that starts for them, let's say, in, 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 in November at Valencia when they first get on the Aprilia. Nice. Well, that's uh, confirmed now for 2023, Oliveira and Fernandez. Uh, exciting to see what they will get up to. Unfortunately, that means it looks like Darren Binder is going to have to uh, look elsewhere. Moto2 perhaps uh, calling for him. Of course, he was the one who made the jump, so he hasn't done Moto2 yet. Um, so maybe another year will uh, better for him. He certainly has uh, done an admirable job, I think, this year in uh, in MotoGP, where a lot of people were slating him at the start. Um, let's uh, end then. We spoke a little bit about Mark Marquez, of course, a bit of news. He's split with his longtime manager. Last week, um, Repsol Honda confirmed, Keith, that they he will be in attendance uh, for this week's Mugello test. Um, so uh, so this week's test, sorry, not Mugello, in Isano. Um So that's that's encouraging signs. Very encouraging. Well, he had that little bit of an out in on the uh, short track at Aragon, didn't he? Blasting around on... Uh, and look, good on the bike. I've got to say, was backing it in, sliding it around, generally getting a feel for being on a motorbike again because he's been on no motorbike. He's not been allowed to train at all to get this, he said, 34 degree. I thought it was 33 degree, but 34 degree correction in his arm. You imagine having your arm bent 30. The only reason I, I'm, I can't put it in perspective when I think about an arm, but 33 yeah. degrees is the banking at Daytona. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of kind of works him up, and you can't walk up a thirty-three degree banking very well. I've got to say at Daytona. So um, that, that's the, the, the man's pain threshold must be oh, up high, unbelievable. But they put it back, and when you consider he won races with a with an arm that was thirty-three degrees out of kilter, you, you imagine if you had a front wheel that was thirty-three degrees out of kilter compared with the other one, where you'd be going when you were driving down the road. I mean, the, the analogies you can make are just outrageously funny, but um, this isn't funny. This is Mark Marquez, and this is the last chance saloon. You mentioned it last time we were talking about it. Grandad said to him, enough. You know, you've done enough. You've got where, you, where you've got to. But 
Mark has decided this is the last hurrah. If this does not work, that'll be it for Mark Marquez. I've got the feeling that when you see him around the paddock, shaking hands with people and all the rest of it, he's using that arm in normal day-to-day -day activity, which he wasn't before. So clearly, this thing is, is in good order. And if he, you know, I mean, I'm not expecting great things from him from the test at all, because he's, he's definitely not fit compared with his normal fitness, which is off the scale. Um, but you can be pretty sure he's going to look pretty damn good on that bike this week. I can't wait to see the pictures. You can, see, you can tell that you've got, you've got that excitement in your tone, Keith. You're excited for this one. I am. I think we all are. <laughs> I think so. Um, and Pete, testing as well. Are we covering that on Crash? Yes, we will be, yeah. Um, as you say, Mark will be on the bike on Tuesday. He says he's not sure about Wednesday. I mean, you've got to believe it. It'd be hard to keep him off it. But what he found at Aragon was um, that, that actually on the second day, he woke up and he was, you know, he was in a bit of pain. But then the day after that, he felt okay again. So he's not quite sure how his arm is going to sort of live up to having back-to-back -back days on a MotoGP bike, but he'll be definitely on it on Tuesday. The point is, is that he made, is, and as Keith says, he said, look, my arm's been 34 degrees out of line for a year and a half. All of the muscles, everything has to be, you know, readapt to, to having his arm back in line. And the doctors have told him it might be until this winter to actually get fully fit in terms of the muscles and everything else. That's that's where the bone is fully healed, we should say. You know, he said, look, I wouldn't be coming back unless the bone was fully healed. The doctor told him completely healed. It's everything else that he's got to work on now. It's the fitness, as Keith says. He hasn't been on a bike. He's got to build all that muscle, muscle up again. He doesn't even know which muscles he needs to build up again yet until he rides the bike and he sees, right, where does it hurt? What's weak? He's got to go through all of that process. What he did say was, because obviously people are saying, well, you know, Mark's going to be back at, back at Aragon racing. And there is a chance. I mean, he's saying, look, it all depends on how this goes at the test. But what he won't do is he won't be skipping any races. Because some people say, you brought up the, the schedule that's coming up, you know, all these races. And, and people say, well, you know, maybe, Mark, would you do Aragon? Then maybe do, you know, Mategi, but then sit out the next one. Or, you know, and then it's to give himself a bit of time between races rather than the back-to-back -back schedule that all the full-time guys are doing. And he said, no, look, if I come back, it's to do every race. And he fully intends to race this year. We're going to see him race this year somewhere. It's how many races he does. But that's that's what he said. He said, look, there's no, I'm not going to be dipping in and out, you know, do this race, miss the next one. So when we do see him come back, it will be to finish the season. And uh, one more thing I should just add for the tests for any any tech people out there. I got a WhatsApp from Gunther Weisinger, who is the editor of speedweek.com. Uh, German language website owned by by Red Bull, and he's got a good scoop this morning that Calix are building a swing arm for HRC. Now that is massive. You know, Honda do everything in house. So if this is true, and I have no reason to doubt this, and well, you'll be easy to see because at the moment they've got a carbon fiber swing arm. So you know, you can easily see the difference on the bike if you put an aluminium one back on. We know that Scott Redding's BMW is skipping championships a bit. That's gone to the Calix, hasn't it? I think you've raised this before, and it, and it made an instant improvement for Scott. So you know, did that influence HRC? Who knows? But the point here is HRC, who normally do everything in-house. Yes, they might get some outside people in for electronics or something, but they do it in-house. It seems like they've gone to Calix and gone, look, can you build us some swing arms? So it shows the extent of, of, of their situation at the moment that they're willing to do that. So that's something for people to look out for as well. Mark, presumably, will be testing these swing arms at, uh, at Mizano tomorrow. I must excuse um, the squeaking in the background if you're wondering what that is, folks. My window cleaner is here. <laughs> oh, last week it was it was the cleaner of the house. Now it's the window cleaner. Honestly, the Hewan household, the Hewan manor, clearly. <laughs> well, the, getting a... the, the butlers just stood behind the screen here. Just waiting oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, are you getting a foot massage as well throughout these podcasts? You can't <laughs> quite see that. No, the wife's out. <laughs> well look I, I'm having I'm having visions of those you know the skyscrapers when you see them cleaning them and they're going down from floor to floor I just I think that's Keith's house isn't it yeah. it's just you know they, they stumbled across the penthouse uh, at the wrong time and, uh, well the uh, the lights are going to be switched off now at the Hewan Manor and uh, that brings us uh, to the end of another podcast thank you very much gents as always thank you uh, for watching along we'll have all of the um, testing action uh, keeping you up to speed with what's going on on crash.net pete giving uh, and the whole team uh, 
uh, giving us uh, reports and updates from that throughout the week, as well as everything else you'll need to know. A bit of a weekend off before we're back. I mean, it really is thick and fast. Uh, four races in five weeks. So get your questions in. Uh, leave them in the comments section or tweet Instagram, Facebook us. Just search Crash Moto GP. Leave us a review as well. Very important that wherever you get your podcasts as well. And uh, myself, Harry Benjamin, Keith Ewan and Pete McLaren will see you right back here next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.